What's up, my friend? Welcome to the Finding Direction podcast. My name is Stu Massengill, and I'm here every single week to bring you a passionate guest or message dedicated to helping you find your purpose so that you can live a life full of passion, fulfillment, and happiness. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for hanging out with me, and let's dive in. Welcome back to another episode on Finding Direction, my friend. I hope you are having an unbelievable day. And if you're not, I can promise you it's going to be a little bit more unbelievable of a day after you listen to this week's episode as I sit down with Mark Schultz. And a little bit about Mark Schultz. He is the Associate Director of the Harvard Study of Adult Development. It is the longest scientific study that has ever been done on happiness. It's been done for over 85 years. Uh, It's an incredible, incredible study we dive a lot into. He is also a professor of psychology. He's the director of science program and previously chaired the psychology department and clinical developmental psychology PhD program at Bryn Mawr. I know that's a mouthful. Um, On this episode, some of the things we talk about is the biggest insights on how to live a good life from the studies they've done following people for literally 85 years. Uh, They follow people from their teen ages all the way to their 70s, 80s until they passed away. It's an unbelievable study. We talk about the biggest insights from that. We talk about the one thing you need to start doing immediately to increasing your ability to live a good life. And we dive into the surprising truth about money and living a good life and some of the correlations that lie between those two. Um, There is so much goodness in this episode. I'm so excited for you to dive into it. If you have not yet, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can join us every single week on this show. And without further ado, here we go. Mark Schultz, welcome to the show, man. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you, Stu. Real pleasure to be with you today. Yeah, heck yeah. And so as we dive into our conversation today, um, you know, you've been part of this study that I think is so fascinating, um, you know, with Harvard and the study of adult development, which has been the longest study on, I think it's the longest study ever, right? And a huge piece of it is happiness. And I'm curious, could you share for our listener um, who maybe has never heard of this study, can you share a little bit more about what exactly this is? Yeah, it's really an incredible study. So it, it may not be the longest yeah. study of all time, but it's certainly the longest study of happiness and well-being. Um, yeah. And we we have a feeling probably of human beings. So it started in the late 1930s at an extraordinary time. It was the throes of the Depression were still going on in the U.S. Uh, it was also on the eve of World War II. These were actually two studies of 724 participants. Both had a common focus on trying to figure out what led to human thriving, but in very different circumstances. So two thirds of those 724 participants came from the poorest neighborhoods of Boston. They grew up mostly in tenement buildings, very crowded circumstances, Uh, poor families. Most of them were immigrant families as well. So facing real challenges in life. The remaining one third lived across the city. They were students at Harvard University. Uh, Very different prospects on life. Uh, They were sophomores. In both groups, the researchers, even though they were distinct groups, were really interested in the circumstances in which these participants were growing up, what led them to do well. So in the inner city kids, uh, very challenging neighborhoods, uh, what led them to do okay in school, to avoid uh, getting in trouble with the law, to graduate to, you know, again, to, to you know, right. go to class, go to school, stay out of trouble. In the Harvard sample, what led to, you know, kind of happiness and thriving. Um, both samples have now been followed for their entire lives to the end of their life. <laughs> Most of the so original cool. participants have died. Uh, along the way, the wives of the original participants uh, were included in the study. And we're actually now for the last 10 years studying the 1,315 children of the original participants. That is so cool. So amazing from, study. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I was looking at some of the pictures um, of, of the study before this, and it's, it's just mind-blowing. You see someone who's, um, you know, in their late teens, and all of a sudden you see a picture of them, and they're in their 70s and 80s, and it's like, it's just like to think that for all of their life, you've been sitting in a chair, not obviously every day, but 
throughout that entirety of their life, you've been sitting there with them having conversations on it, it, it's, it's an unbelievable, fascinating study. It is incredible. And I consider myself so lucky. So we have, you know, file drawers on each of those 724 participants <laughs> wow. filled with information. So photos, responses to questionnaires, which happened every two years or so interviews, which happened at least every 10 years. And we were really interested in trying to understand what was going on inside the heads of these folks as they grew up. So this followed people really closely. So uh, yeah, it's like a big family album of 724 families. So incredible. Yeah. So cool. And so I know, um, you know, yourself and Robert, you wrote the book, The Good Life, which was um, really sharing a lot of the insights and takeaways from this study. And before we dive into some of the takeaways and, and just insights you pulled from the study i'm curious for you in in the lens of this book like what would you say is the definition of a good life i think um people can see it in a lot of different ways so what's the way that you see a good life i think that's right so i'm going to give you my definition and i'll tell you how psychologists including us usually <laughs> measure it yeah so a, a good life unlike what we may have been persuaded by the media or social media or posts isn't just about being happy or being happy all the time it's really about a sense of meaning and purpose. It's a sense that when we step back, life is satisfying. It certainly includes moments of joy and happiness that we all appreciate and value when we have them. But it's pretty hard to experience life, and it's certainly hard to experience the ups without also experiencing the downs. So the good life comes with challenges. It's uh, In the book, yeah. we say, spoiler alert, the good life also includes challenges <laughs> and disappointment. Um, yeah. So it's the whole gamut of experiences of human life. And a good life is one that's well lived in which we lean in and we experience all those, the highs and the lows together. When yeah. psychologists study the good life, when they're interested in happiness, because of what I just described, they usually study two key things, which is our moment to moment emotions. Are we happy? Are we sad? Are we anxious? Um, mm -hmm. And then a kind of more stable um, Kind of view about the world or perspective about the world life is generally satisfying it has meaning um, i have a sense of purpose and meaning in my life so both of those things are important and we certainly tried to tap into those ideas as well okay w what were some of the biggest like lessons you took because you say there's moments of ups moments of downs and i'm assuming when you're asking people questions you could ask them the same questions when they're in an up and a down and they're entirely different so from the moments when people are in down and maybe you're even calling them saying, Hey, we're going to ask you questions again. And they're going, I'm not like, I'm not, I don't, I don't really feel like talking. Like I'm not in a good place in my life. And you have those conversations when they're in that place. What, what were some of the biggest takeaways you had from people that, yeah, we're in the lows. So a few important ideas. One is that 84% of the original participants stayed with the study across their lives, right? So even in the most challenging of times, People were very Man. kind and committed to the study. We can talk about the reasons why, but they were really committed to the study. It's extraordinary for any study, but one that lasts 85 yeah. years, it's really spectacular. Yeah. Um, so I think we have a sense of what people's lives were like during the good times and the bad times. Yeah. And I think the, the big picture message here is that, you know, it's, it's not whether you're happy all the time, because that's impossible. Um, I don't think that's really possible to, to be. Um, life throws us curveballs, it throws us challenges, it happens at all periods in our life. Sometimes we're lucky, years can go by, a decade can go by, we don't have any significant challenges, but they will come yeah. at some point in our lives. So it's how we deal with those challenges, how we rise to the occasion. Particularly important when we deal with challenges is, is the, the resources that we have, especially the social resources, the connections that we have, the people right. we can depend on. So people who did well were people who leaned into challenges. They didn't ignore them. They didn't make believe they didn't exist. They didn't downplay them. And they really used the connections in their life to meet those challenges head on. Interesting. And, and what were some of like, if we look at the study as a whole now, right, all these years you followed them, what were some of the key takeaways as far as like what really differentiated people, whether they were from, again, the Harvard group, the other group, like what were some of the main, yeah. what could have been like surprises or takeaways as far as like what you really discovered that 
Yeah. yeah. So some of some of it's really expectable that when we look at key things that predict particularly physical health, for example, it's the common things we now know in the you know year 2023. Uh, smoking's not good for you. Drinking in <laughs> excess is not good for you. Exercise yeah. is good. And going to the doctor is a good thing. Those things mm -hmm. are important. So we like to say, take care of your body like you're going to have it for 100 years. That's a really important idea. Love that. Um, the other piece, which we were kind of surprised that there was so simple a message, you know, hundreds and hundreds of studies across 85 years, is that it's relationships that play a key role in keeping us happy and healthy throughout the lifespan. So the healthy part is the surprising part. Stu, you asked about something that might be surprising. And we yeah. were surprised at how frequently it was relationships were predicting physical health, even how long we lived. So for example, early on, we found that it wasn't your cholesterol at age 50 that predicted your the quality of your aging in your 80s, both the physical and psychological quality of your, of your aging. It was your satisfaction with your primary relationship in life that predicted the quality of your aging. Lots of other findings like that that tell us that the quality and also the number of connections that we have are important in predicting our health, our physical health. Um, it was surprising when we first found it. We looked to other studies because good science builds on many studies, not just one, because each study right. has its own idiosyncratic nature. Uh, and we found this finding across many studies. We're now kind of unpacking why it might be that relationships get under our skin, shape our physical health, even our brain health as well. Um, but I think 20, 30 years ago, uh, we were just establishing uh, scientifically in a reliable way that this connection was there. And our study has helped to do that. Interesting. Yeah, because I mean, it's it's interesting when you think of some of the pictures you're painted when you're growing up, it's like, oh, you want to be, you want to live a good life, you make a good income, right? It's like, there's things that are geared more towards that rather than like, hey, have a supportive community and group that you're close with. Um, and so I'm curious, like, as it looks to having relationships, is it, you know, that you have a great uh, partner in life and you're really close with them? Is it that you have a good social circle? Like, is there specific things within the sort of relationship bubble that you did yeah. discover? So the answer to each of your questions is yes, it's all kinds <laughs> of relationships matter. Um, if you're lucky enough to have an intimate partner that you have a strong relationship with, and that's a stable and long relationship, it's a great gift and benefit in life. If you yeah. haven't been so lucky, uh, you haven't found that partner, or you had a marriage and it, it dissolved, it wasn't uh, one of satisfaction and kind of mutuality. It's okay. There are lots of other relationships that are important. So friendships are important, uh, relationships that we establish at work, neighbors, uh, relatives that we have, our parents, our kids, our you know yeah. cousins growing up, they're all important, our siblings. Um, it turns out that when we really sit back and think about it, and we did this for the book when we wrote The Good Life, it's startling how many things relationships give us. I think we know it intuitively, but when we really do that accounting, it's extraordinary, right? We, we have a sense of identity that comes from our relationships. We have history with people that are important to us that we share and helps us, again, figure out who we are. Um, relationships are particularly important in helping us deal with stress. So they're really good stress busters. When I'm stressed, I need a friend or a wife yeah. to help me manage my emotions, to think mm -hmm. about um, you know, paths forward that maybe I haven't thought of, um, even to challenge me in certain ways. You know, Mark, um, I don't think you're thinking about this the right way, <laughs> right? Good friends do that for us. So yeah. um, it's all kinds of relationships and it's unlikely. For some people, they're incredibly lucky. They find that in one person. It's often a, a partner in life. But for yeah. many of us, we need so much from relationships. We're getting it from multiple people. Okay. Is there any discoveries you guys had on like why you feel like some people don't have those relationships? Like I know one of the stories um, you guys tell in the book is about John and Leo, right? And they had these two sort of different lives they lived. One yep. was really happy. One wasn't as happy. Yeah. So from all these people, like, was there like, is there anything that stood out that you go, wow, it, this person didn't have, as many, didn't have as many relationships and it was because of like, like, yeah, why didn't some people have that or make it a priority? Well, I think you you alluded to this idea, which is so important that we get a lot of messages about what's important in life, what will make us happy, what will lead to the good yeah. life. Um, a lot of them have to do with success and achievement and money. If I make a certain amount of money, then I'll be happy. 
for young people, it's an idea that maybe happiness I'll worry about in the future, just like relationships. I'll, I'll strive to do well at work or school and five years or 10 years, I'll work on relationships. And what we find is life moves quickly that people who say <laughs> they're going to work on something in the future sometimes don't get to it. And we found that with our yeah. participants. So there were people who showed signs of struggling with relationships in their 20s who figured it out, but there were other people who neglected their relationships and they never really developed. They never developed uh, connections with others that they could depend on. So when the going got tough, they didn't have that network. Mm. Um, and you know, these folks were born in the 1910s and 20s. It might feel like a, you know, a generation that's very huh. different than today. Yeah. I know a lot of your viewers are younger, um, but the, their stories are not that different, right? So you mentioned John and Leo, and John was a, a very bright student. He had done really well in high school. He went to Harvard. He studied, he was interested in ideas, and he studied philosophy, and he spent a lot of time in his head. It was really important for him to do well. Um, talk about challenges. World War II happened, so his life got interrupted. He served state, stateside during the war. Uh, but after the war, he went to law school. He went to University of Chicago, which is a leading law school. He did really well. He worked for a great firm. But along the way, he didn't tend to his connections with others. He really focused on what was going on in his head and yeah. strive for the kind of achievements that led to his own kind of sense of purpose in a narrow way. But he didn't have those connections with others. He got married late. His first marriage was not a success. His second marriage was also what he described as a loveless marriage. Along the way, he really uh, became estranged from his children. So he lived a, a life that was both disconnected from others, and it turns out he was one of the least happy people as well. So part of the lesson here, Stu, about you know who does well is it's about intention. That if we it, you know think hard, we reflect, and we intentionally lean into our connections with others, we get benefits from that. If we lean away from those relationships, we let them slide, kind of put them yeah. on automatic pilot. Sometimes we don't establish them. And maybe more importantly, once we establish them, they wither. If we don't give our relationships sort of the, the, the light of day and the cultivation they need, they wither over time. So really important for us to commit our energy and our time and our precious attention to relationships. That's an important priority in life. Okay. So the, the way I almost... Uh hear it and try to like put it in understanding in my own mind is like if we look at the values that we have in our life right some people are like oh what some of my top values are i want to be successful i want to um, have freedom or whatever it's like from what i'm understanding from this conversation your guys takeaways is if you want to live a good life it makes sense to put relationships somewhere in one of your higher values it's something that's gonna it's gonna bring you a lot of happiness. It's going to bring you a good life to have that higher in your values. I think that's right, that relationships need to be a priority and they help us. Of course, we all know this. They help us in our work. They help us in our yeah. you know, pursuit of leisure. If we want to do recreational activities, it, it often pays to do it with other people. Um, but they also should be a goal in and of themselves. They give us meaning. They give us a sense that life is bigger than ourselves. And yeah. when those challenges hit, it's the people in our lives that are going to mm -hmm. be really important. Yeah, in our yeah. study, we asked this question, which turned out to be really important. In the middle of the night, if you're sick or scared, who can you call? Some people had a list, you know, there are 10 people yeah. in my life and other people, even with a partner in their life, there was no one that they could reach out to. Yeah, so really important for us to have, you know, to, to know that someone has our back, uh, that when we're challenged, yeah. we have that person in our life. It's also important, you know, young people have astronomical rates of the experience of loneliness. Loneliness is at an epidemic mm -hmm. level across uh, all populations in the United States. Some studies suggest as high as 50% of adults feel lonely. So lonely is the experience that mm -hmm. no one really knows you. No one cares about whether you're doing okay or not. No one has your back. Young people are at some of the highest rates of loneliness, young and old people, mm -hmm. uh, oddly enough, both ends of the age spectrum. So for young people in particular, I think it's challenging. There are lots of tasks that are important, getting ahead, achieving, figuring out what you're going to yeah. do. Those are all tasks that we think a lot about when we're young. Um, but we can't forget the importance of our connections with others, really important along the way. Yeah. And I think it's a good uh, note to put in right here for any of our listeners to pull out your phone right now and text somebody that you care about, right? Or Love um, it. 
you know, by the end of the day, like call an old friend that you've been thinking about catching up with call, you know, a, a sibling, a parent or an uncle an aunt, like someone and just take one step towards that today. So we can be, you know, action oriented to say, let's, let's get closer to living a good life. Let's send someone a message, something, something simple, but again, moves us in the needle, uh, love it in the forward love direction. It. Yeah. Heck yeah. So, um, one thing I'd be curious is if we dive into the idea of money, right? I think for a lot of people you go, I want to be happy. I need money. Um, it's, you know, I think the idea is that there would be some correlation between money and happiness. And I know there's studies out there that, um, you know, diff have different things. And I'm, I'm just curious from your guys' study specifically, what did you discover when it comes to, um, money and happiness? Yeah. So in our study, people from very different walks of life, there was no connection between uh, original money, like the money you had growing up, um, okay. the money that you earned in your career once you made it into adulthood and our, and one's happiness, that those two were independent. So there were folks that grew up in the inner city in destitute poverty that lived a good life and were very happy. And there were folks like we talked about John, the lawyer, who yeah. were incredibly successful, earned incredible amounts of money and were quite unhappy. The literature on, on happiness and income is really interesting. It's complicated. Do you think it's such an interesting question? Maybe, yeah. you know, I'm a scientist at heart, so maybe it's not so surprising that it's um, kind of complicated because we can't randomly assign people to have money and other people to not have money. That's how we do science. We have to look at the <laughs> correlation between money yeah. and happiness, so it gets more complicated. But this is my read of the literature. There are certainly papers that might challenge this. Um, a certain amount of money is important, particularly in the United States, for basic needs, shelter, security, uh, so safety I'm talking about, uh, food, right. health care. A certain amount of money is important. Maybe a middle class income in the United States is about what I'm talking about. That gives us a certain control over our basic needs, an idea that we control some of our life, that we're not totally dependent on the whims of other people. Yeah. After that, most studies show that the connection between increases in income and happiness are just not there, or if they are there, they're very small, I think surprisingly small for people. Mm -hmm. So you might, after a middle class income, have to earn two to three times more income than you're earning right now to see a very tiny gotcha. increment change in your happiness. Again, the research isn't so good because it's not really experimental. It's really across people as well. So there are lots of things that get in the way, kind of noisy data is what I would say. Um, so I think this idea that happiness will make us, uh, sorry, that, that success will make us happy, that money is important for our success. The data is just not there. The research is not there. Hmm. Interesting. Did you see anything in relation to, um, you know, I think like, Oftentimes people go, I want to have an impact in my life. I want to make a difference. Was there any research you found with people you go, oh, this person made more of a difference. Therefore, yeah. they had more. Ha like, was there any takeaways in that regard? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question, Stu, because I also, as I said, what I, I just said, I want to also say that a sense of meaning and purpose in life is really important. Uh, so, it, you know, our jobs often give us that sense of meaning. They structure our lives. So it's not that they're unimportant. It's just we overestimate the importance of money in it and the achievements in our life. So if I get this promotion, everything will be great. If I get this award, everything will be great. It turns out we get a momentary boost from those kinds of things. And then we often return to our kind of baseline level mm -hmm. of happiness. Um, but you're talking about something that's important that we can achieve in a way that helps other people. And I think that's a different kind of achievement. It's a very relational kind of achievement, right? So the work that I do um, brings meaning to other people. It helps totally. them live lives that are more meaningful, uh, that might be better lives. Something like your podcast, for example, brings really valuable information yeah. to others. And there's a certain kind of satisfaction and meaning that that gives us when we're able to do things for other people. And I think that does bring satisfaction. And I would argue that part of it has to do again with the relational benefits. There's nothing better. I'm sure you have lots of stories. Mm -hmm. Stu, someone says, you know, I heard your podcast. It was really meaningful for me. Uh, it's made a real difference in your life. We wrote a book. I get some of that feedback sometimes. Yeah. What a nice thing to get, right? That yeah. makes life meaningful. It brings a smile to my face. So yeah, of course, helping others, really important idea in life. Yeah. And an interesting... And we can... Uh, oh, go ahead. 
I was just going to add, I mean, we can help people in all sorts of ways, right? You don't have to do charity work or volunteer work um, at work. You can help mentor someone that's just learning the skills that you've already learned. Um, you can volunteer in your community. There's so many ways that we can help other people. And it turns out that we, when we do things for other people and when we express gratitude to other people, we benefit ourselves. So yeah. uh, really important idea. Yeah. And an interesting connection you make too, where it's like, well, if you feel like you're making more of an impact, a lot of what creates that feeling is the relationship that that shares that you're making an impact, right? So again, it comes back to this idea of relationships. I think that's right. You know, we we I remember writing about this in our book. You know, I, it's a great thing to yeah. write a book with someone else because you don't just have <laughs> to have a dialogue in your own head. <laughs> yeah. You can have that discussion with your collaborator. And Bob and I talked a lot about you know, the most important successes in our own lives. And when we think about people, we're both therapists. When we think about our, our clients that might talk about their experiences and when they're most happy, it's not just achievement, really. It's about a sense that that achievement brings pleasure or pride to people that are part of their network, that they can share that success with yeah. others. So relational wins, relational successes, um, those are important in life. We have to figure out ways to achieve that. So again, to go back to this uh, example that we use in the book, John Marsden, the lawyer, he achieved things that are just incredible. I mean, he's yeah. the envy of lots of other lawyers in terms of what he was able to yeah. do, but he didn't have a lot of people he could share that success with. And ultimately mm -hmm. it begins to feel hollow, that success, if you don't have people who you're connected to who might feel a sense of stake and, and pleasure and pride in that success as well. Hmm. Interesting. So if we, let's say, had someone and we go, we're going to prescribe a good life for you, right? We're going to create a good life. Here's your menu. There's three things we're going to put on this menu or this prescription that you need to do these three things throughout your life and you're going to have a good life. Um, what would those three things be? I'm guessing one would be relationships and what would other parts? Yeah, though I don't want to, I, I can talk about other parts, but I don't want to leave it as just relationships, right? There's so much we can do around relationships. We we can, as you said, reach out to people, let them know that they're important to us. We can make time for the people that are important. So many things grabbing our time, again, particularly when we're young, we're leaning into work. Uh, there's so much stuff on the internet and on social media that's grabbing <laughs> our attention. It's really good at doing that. So yeah. we have to kind of resist that. We can't be on automatic pilot. We have to use that precious time we have and our precious attention for the things mm -hmm. that are important. We're hoping again that relationships will be a part of it. And I think more generally, we need to be reflective and aware of what's going on in our relationships. So, you know, young people maybe who went to college, um, you know, social life is, is kind of almost automatic. There's a party happening most weekends you go to, you're yeah. around lots of people who are your own age. Um, as you get older, you have to be more thoughtful and planful about those events. Um, I think COVID was a great lesson in that, right? We lost the kind of immediate connections that we had. Sure. We had to be more purposeful. And I think it's important in life to do that as well. Um, so stepping back more generally, you asked about things that people can do. I think, you know, leading a life that is reflective in nature, not just being on automatic pilot, kind of checking in with yourself. You know, how am I doing? What's important to me in life? Am I doing those things? Um, those are important um, opportunities for you to kind of evaluate yeah. that alignment between your priorities and the life that you're living. We all need to do that. And I think it's particularly important when we're young. Because when we're young, we're at the kind of beginning of a fork, right? As we as we sort of go off on different directions, it may get harder and harder to get back to where our priorities are. So really important yeah. to check in. Some people might do that regularly once a month or on a birthday or at the new year. Um, check in about our key parts of our life, our relationships, our work, our family, um, yeah. our beliefs. If we have you know beliefs about community or religion, that's also an important time to check in about that. Okay, cool. All right. So um, if we change the page a little bit, um, yeah, you know, there's so many good insights from this study. But one part of your uh, life that I'm also very curious about is your journey, right, of getting to um, this place where you're part of this study, you're teaching and, and all these different things you're doing in your life. And I'm curious if we go way back to, you know, let's say 20 year old Mark, um, you're stepping foot into the real world. Like, th is this something that you go, man, this is something I'm going to do one day. Um, did you have an idea of what you want to do? Like kind of how, how did the journey pan out to where you, where you got to where you are today? Yeah. So I think, 
my life unfolded like many of the lives that we study in the, you know, in the, in our research. Um, yeah. When I was 20, I had no idea what I would end up doing. Really no idea. The, the one benefit I had when I was uh, kind of 18 plus is I spent a lot of my summers doing internships before internships were a thing. I was, mm. I was a trendsetter in only one thing in my life, which is during <laughs> college. This is in the 1980s. I actually had summer jobs that taught me something about what it was like to work. So the first yeah. job I had, I was a neuroscience guy. I was a real science geek. Huh. And I worked. I got this great job. It was actually right before college. I worked in a lab. I was going to study. I did study the visual system of goldfish to try and understand how it worked. Intellectually, really interesting. <laughs> interesting. But I found the goldfish kind of boring. They didn't talk yeah. back to me. They, they, it wasn't very engaging. I found right. myself actually a little bit lonely working in the lab. Um, so then I began to, in addition to the science, I got really interested in social science. Um, and in those days, social studies was sort of a, I don't know, it was like a stepchild of the family. It wasn't really the favorite child, certainly in high school, but in college, I realized that that was where a lot of my interests are. So I did a series of internships in public policy settings. I did some writing. I did some community organizing work. And for me, again, it was this battle between I love the writing, I love the thinking, but sometimes I felt lonely when I did it. I wanted to be with other people. Organizing was fun. I was with people a lot, um, but then I didn't have time to think. And eventually I figured out that psychology was sort of a good middle ground um, that was going to allow me to think and do research to keep that science going. That was important to me. But I could spend a lot of time with people, you know, not goldfish. And that worked out <laughs> yeah. great. Really good decision. Um, I have to say, so I took a few years off between college and graduate school. And when I went to graduate school, still wasn't sure I had made the right decision to a Ph.D. program. After the first year, I can remember still not being completely sure. In hindsight, really good decision for me. Yeah, I met my wife in graduate school. I got lucky on that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the school itself was really what I wanted to do. I had other options. I could have gone to medical school was another possibility and pursued it that way. But for me, psychology was great. And that was where I got introduced to this kind of research, following people across time in longitudinal studies. Um, I did some of that in graduate school. As a, a postgraduate, as a postdoc, I did some work in Boston with another study that looked at the transition from adolescence into adulthood. And then about 20 years ago, my colleague, Bob Waldinger, who I wrote this book with, yeah. who I had met on that initial study looking at adolescence to adulthood, and we had become close colleagues and friends at that point, he was asked to take over this Harvard study that had mm. been going on at that point for 65 years. And he said, sure, is it okay if I bring Mark with me? And uh, <laughs> that's, that's the history there. So really lucky. That's so cool. I'm curious, in this other study you did, um, another really interesting phase of life to study, right? The kind of this transition. Um, what were some of the discoveries you found out in that study? Yeah, so so one of the big ones, which I think is so important, it's it's a when I first heard about this idea, I thought it was just about wording and subtlety and it really wasn't meaningful, but it turns out to be really important. So hmm. teenagers from our, you know, kind of, beginning of teens through mid twenties, for sure. Sometimes it lasts longer. We're really trying to figure out how to be more and more autonomous and independent. And for many people in their head, that means they should disconnect with parents. And I think that those two don't need to be completely at tension. There is a tension there, but they don't need to be completely at tension. So the folks who do well, this is what our research showed and other folks, uh, mm -hmm. other studies have shown are the folks that achieve that autonomy or increase in autonomy, why they maintained a connection with their family. It's a really important idea that we can rebel in small ways, right? But rebellion and autonomy doesn't need to mean that we reject our parents. So figuring that out as adolescents, as young adults, really challenging. For parents, this is one of the most challenging times of parents. I have friends who talk about you know, my kids aren't young anymore. They're in adolescence and I'm looking forward to the break that that's going to bring. And I say, oh, they're going to be different challenges. It's not about, <laughs> yeah. you know, carpools so much anymore or going to baseball games or softball games. Um, it's really about figuring out how to help them become more independent without feeling yourself for a parent, without feeling yourself being rejected and not needed anymore. So that journey is a challenging one. It takes people, yeah. you know, usually it's a five to 10 year process. But doing it while maintaining that connection, being able to lean on your parents or your family members that are have supported you, that's the key in many ways to getting into young adulthood, that phase okay. of life.
And was there anything you discovered as far as some of the individuals in that study that found ways to become more autonomous, like more effectively versus some that just like never found it? Well, I think, I think we all need to feel, you know, a sense that we're doing things differently than our parents. As we get older, we may be more accepting of some of the things that our parents do and surprised that we do things like our parents. <laughs> um, but the, the folks that do well in adolescence, they find ways of feeling independent of, of doing some of that rebelliousness, um, in ways that are, are safer and, and safer psychologically and physically. So they don't put themselves in positions where they're jeopardizing their physical safety or physical health. Um, but you know, they, they wear different clothes or they put on makeup that's, you know, a bit racier than their parents might have yeah. done, uh, an earring, you know, you know, whatever it is at the particular, uh, point in life, a uh, kind of tattoo these days maybe might be a better example. Um, we find ways of rebelling or establishing that we're different and we're of a different generation that still allows us to embrace some of the nice things that our parents may have given us. We all, even those of us are raised in, you know, the most incredibly generous and lovely homes. There are challenges that all parents, you know, uh, uh, bring to the table. So no one's perfect, yeah. including our parents. We're not perfect either. So we have to figure out ways to kind of rebel, achieve some of that autonomy in a safe way. Parents also need to let that happen as well. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. when parents tell me I'm not going to let my kid do this, you got to pick your battles, right? You yeah, really want to pick fair. your battles. And adolescence has gotten extended. So we used to talk about this, you know, at age 18, you kind of grew out of adolescence. Most people talk about extended adolescence well into the 20s. And some of those issues happen right up into, you know, early 30s as well. Yeah. Interesting. So my last question on this study um, is one of the things you talk about in the Harvard study, right, is having a sense of purpose and meaning, right, aside from relationship and other things that create a good yep. life. So if we go to this sort of adolescence transition, um, was there anything you found out in this in this research that got people quicker to find their purpose and their meaning? Like, was there any takeaways yeah. around um, what helped someone find that maybe quicker? Yeah. So, so I'm going to answer it two ways. One is cool. the bigger message, and then I want to say something particular about this study. Um, we all need some loving, caring adult in our life. So those of us who are lucky to have parents that might fulfill that role, it's great. But a lot of yeah. people grow up in homes where they're not supported or nurtured in that way. And what we know from our own research and from lots of other studies is that having one caring adult in our life when we're children and adolescents is really important. It helps make that uh, kind of ascension into the next stage of life much mm -hmm. easier. So it might be a caring teacher or a grandparent. My parents mm -hmm. divorced when I was young. Um, my grandparents, uh, several of them are really important, but my grandfather is particularly important to me as I, um, you know, as a support figure outside of my own family. It could be a coach. It could be, again, uh, another relative that might provide that role. Okay. Um, the part that I want to talk about in our study is just remarkable to think about in our current world. So um, John and Leo, the two men that you alluded yeah. to that we talk about in the book, both from the Harvard study, were at Harvard and graduating in the early 1940s. Well, what was happening in the early 1940s was World War II. So like 91% of their other peers in our study, they volunteered to serve in World War II. So talk about a sense of purpose and meaning that when you look at their experiences in the war, again, 91% of them, I think, I, you know, just bears repeating because people can't imagine serving yeah. in the war. A very different time, a war that many people felt was really critical for the future of the world. Um, when they are asked about their experiences, particularly with some distance from from them, they talk about it in an interesting way. They say this was the worst, scariest experience of their lives. And at the same time, it was one of the best experiences in their mm -hmm. lives. And when they're asked what the best part of it is, they talk about the connections that they had with other people. They literally, their lives depended on the people that were next to them in these foxholes that they went into combat with. The connections that they made were really important and deep. And they had such a high sense of meaning and purpose in their early 20s. They felt like they were doing something important, that they were saving the world. And I think it's possible that they were. Yeah. Um, so they got a sense of meaning very quickly. Yeah. yeah. The inner city kids were a little bit younger. They were born later, so they missed World War II. Many of them, though, served in the Korean War. 
So I think there, there are things that we do in our lives. Sometimes it's military service. Sometimes it's work, particularly work that has meaning for others that gives us that, that sense of meaning and purpose. But we all have to be prepared for surprises. Um, and yeah. certainly these men didn't grow up, even though they grew up in the Depression. They didn't grow up expecting a world war to interfere with their lives in their early 20s. So, you know, for, for us, for young people, even for my generation, you know, yeah. just gratitude that I didn't have to reckon with that. I was post-Vietnam War generation. Um, I didn't have to serve in the military. Um, yeah. And there was no war that I, I was confronted with in terms of whether I would serve or not. Yeah, so we have to recognize some ways we live in fortunate times. There are other challenges that are unique to our times, but in some ways we're very fortunate. Yeah, love it. Um, One actually other question I have for the Harvard Business Study is one piece of it, and you can correct me if I have this wrong, but one piece of the study was you would interview and ask questions to the actual um, participant of the study, and then you would ask questions to their family, right, and the people around them. And I forget the exact language you used around it. There's a technical part of uh, what this is called in, in a study. But obviously there's two massive different percep – or maybe not massive, but there's different perceptions yep. on – again, you could ask the same set of questions to the person and to their family, and they may be different. So I'm curious, like, what, what were some of the things you noticed um, as far as, like, the perception the person had in their own life and then the perception yep. that came from family? Yeah, so I think you might be thinking about a cute story that we tell about Henry and Rosa, who are an older couple. And when they tell the story about how they met, their their story differs in important ways. <laughs> and some of it has to do with someone forgetting an article of clothing. It was like socks that were mismatched. And um, I think Henry claimed responsibility, but it was actually Rosa. Um, so we, we certainly have different perspectives on the same event. We know that. So in our study, it's really important to us that we don't just depend on people's construction of their experience. We don't just say, what happened? What, what did you think happened? We ask other people in their life. Yeah. The most dramatic example, Stu, is what we're doing now. So we asked the second generation of 1,315 kids of the original participants. We said, um, tell us about your childhood. What was it like? Um, what were your parents like? Uh, what was happening in your home? Were there people who died during your childhood that were important in your family? Um, did you move a lot? You know, lots and lots of questions about important areas yeah. uh, that, that likely affect people's development. Um, we have some siblings in the second generation, so we also ask those sisters and brothers. And then we can compare that. This is what's remarkable about the study. We've been collecting data for 85 years on their parents. And we can compare that to the data we collected. We call it the eyewitness data we collected along the way. And what yeah. we find are there often are very different portraits of life. Most of us know this if we have siblings, you know, we talk to our, our, I have younger siblings. If I talk to my sister and say, you know, what do you remember about mom and dad at this particular point in our life? Um, it's not uncommon that we have different views of what right. was going on. You know, I'll say they seem really happy. And my sister, sister will say, no, I think they were really worked up about things at that part of their life. Huh. And it's like, what home were you living in is right. My yeah. instinct. But we all see things differently. We see them through our own lenses. So that personal construction tells us things. And because we're able to kind of triangulate, we have one's own construction, we have another sibling's construction. And in this case, we also have the data that we had that we collected as they were growing up when their yeah. parents were participants. We're able to begin to make sense of what those differences are. Um, you know, really interesting. So is it better to have a more positive, overly optimistic view of what your child is like? Those are the kinds of questions that we're trying to investigate now. Very cool. Love it. Well, Mark, um, this has been so amazing to dive into uh, your wisdom and, and everything you've been up to. Uh, I'm curious for our listener, if they're going, I need more of Mark in my life. I need to hang out with this guy. Uh, <laughs> where's the best place for them to find you and just get more of you in their world? So, uh, you know, a good start is our book, The Good Life. One of the things that we yeah. do, Bob and I, my co-author, have a, you know, a real strong connection. So we're part of the story in the book. We tell some stories about ourselves and our families and our connection. Um, we also have a web page for the book, thegoodlifebook.com, with hyphens between each of those words. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, always happy to hear from folks who have read the book and find it meaningful. Uh, so those are some places yeah. and okay, certainly perfect. plenty of podcasts and talks and interviews <laughs> yeah. you can find out there on the web as well. Love it. Love it. So my last question for you, a uh, question we ask for all of our guests because we want to help our listener find direction, but we believe in doing it through action 
is what would you say is one thing our listener can do in the next 24 to 48 hours to start finding direction in their life? Yeah, I think you you sort of stole my answer. Um, so I'm going to revive it <laughs> and, and maybe amplify it. Like reach okay. out to someone that you care about. Maybe if you're thinking about direction in your life, think about someone who's older than you, someone from the next generation or even a generation mm -hmm. after that. Um, say, you know, I'm trying to think about the next step of my life. I'm trying to think about the direction that I might go in. It might be a very specific question about work or whether you're going to have kids or get married. Um, could we talk? I'm really interested in how you navigated those years. Yeah. Most of us who are older are really flattered than anyone would care about, <laughs> you know, our wisdom or anything that we've experienced. People like to share their experience. So I would yeah. recommend reaching out to folks in their network. They might ask people, uh, you know, who do you know that's older that might have a kind of wise word to share? And the key is is listening, that when we say we want to learn from people, we want to ask questions and we want to pause and listen to what they're saying. If we don't understand it, um, good question is to ask. I, you know, I'm just yeah. I'm not getting it. I want to ask you more. Stu, you said something was really important. You said earlier in this interview, you said, I'm going to tell you what I just heard you say. And if you didn't say it right, I would have said, well, Stu, you got most of it, but there's one part yeah. that was different. So listening carefully, letting people know what you hear, uh, you're going to learn a lot yourself. So that's what I would suggest. Reach Beautiful. out. Beautiful. Amazing. Well, Mark, thank you again for being here. Uh, we all are massively, massively grateful. We appreciate you. Thank you, Stu. It was a pleasure talking. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Congratulations, my friend, on crushing it through another episode here on Finding Direction. Make sure you give yourself a pat on the back, a round of applause, because you are one of the few who is not willing to settle for less than a life that lights up your soul, and that is absolutely something worth celebrating. I hope you got something from that episode with Mark. Uh, man, what an incredible study. Um, I would encourage you to go listen to that episode two, three times over because it will truly be your blueprint for how to live a good life. All right, my friend, that's all we have for you today. I want to say thank you so much. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you're not already subscribed, you got to make sure you hit that button so you can hang out with us every single week on this show. Other than that, have an unbelievable, outstanding, incredible, in freaking ridiculous, oh so beautiful, wonderful rest of your day. If you do not feel like going anywhere, don't feel like you need to. I have another episode coming up right after this that you are more than welcome to hang around for. All right, my friend, until next time, I'll talk to you soon.